There's nothing nicer than an old country cemetery. So peaceful out in the out in the sticks here. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce you to our new drummer, Paul Hester, and his yo-yo. Oh, say a few words, Paul, say a few words. Come on. Talk. Paul Hester is here, 1959 to 2005. Paul Hester was a drummer in the band Split Ends. Everybody's got to have an angle. That was Paul's yeah, worked. Yeah, and I, yeah, I just, uh, I just play the drums, you know. And later, with Neil Finn, helped form the band Crowded House in 1985, I think. And they were around for about 10 or 11 years, and then they split up. I remember the final concert of Crowded House together in 1996, and the last song was "Don't Dream It's Over." And I remember Paul Hester playing. And you can see he had tears in his eyes and he was really emotional that this was the end. He went on to form his own band and he appeared on Music Max, which was a cable music channel. Okay guys, now just be really natural. What's going on now? Oh, I don't want to be here. Oh, 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 shit. <laughs> oh, I've rolled my ankle. I can't go on. Music sessions or something, I can't remember the name of it, but he was quite active up to his death. Did you grow up with any shed vibes, you guys? Did the dads have sheds or did any uncles? Were there any great sheds in your childhood that you remember? Barry, what are you up to? Uh, Anthony, I've got some grapes to put in the fruit salad bowl. And Paul the cook? Well, I'm mixing up all the fruit in this bowl. And he appeared on, or didn't appear, but he was on radio, the Mick Malloy and Tony Martin show. He would be a, a guest every week and he was hilarious. I just remember laughing. I don't know what he said, but he was so funny and when the news came out in 2005 that he had ended his own life. That was really tragic and I really felt uh, shattered by that news because I really liked Paul Hester. And to think that he got to a place where he wanted to end his own life is very sad. Here he is, resting in peace, loved son of Michael and Anne, treasured brother of Carolyn, adored father of Sunday and Olive. On the headstone itself there is a drumstick on the right and a feather stick I'll call it which Paul sometimes used to play his drums. You got a good sound from that. I think the song Sister Madly I remember you had that. Paul is buried next to his mother Elizabeth Ann Hester three years almost after her passing. Cherished mother of Paul and Carolyn. And he said, I just play the drums. Thanks, Paul. This is probably my favorite cemetery. I love walking around it. I'm a big fan of walking around cemeteries. And also if you're out and about and you need to use a public toilet, Cemeteries usually have the best toilets. So if you ever near a cemetery and you need to go. Anyway, I don't know, it's just something relaxing about walking through a cemetery. It's always a quiet place, except if there's a loud plane. This might be called a shunting shot, but whatever you decide, you can't help calling it amazingly clever. When he sets the balls rolling, they act as if they're bewitched to the end of the queues and then goodbye. I am at the Melbourne General Cemetery and there's a few famous people buried here but the most interesting is probably Walter Lindrum. Who's here you ask? He was a billiards player. He held the championships. Well, he was the top billiards player from 1933 until his retirement in 1950. And look what they've done here. It's shaped like a billiards table. After this kind of shot, three balls vanish completely. 
it's got the pockets and <laughs> a cue and some balls. There you go. Walter Albert Lindrum. Lindrum. And his wife. It's quite common the wife is put there next to the husband. I'm sure they're okay with it. Passed away 30th of July 1960. 61 years of age. There he is. Incredible. Lindrum concludes his entertainment with the Australian confidence trick. In billiards, of course. Three balls and three pockets. Here we have Robert O'Hara Burke and William John Wills. Burke and Wills. They were explorers who travelled from Melbourne up to... The idea was to get to the Gulf of Carpentaria, north coast. Because people didn't really know what was in the middle of Australia. Was there an inland sea? They didn't know. It had never been explored by white people. Most of the men stayed in Cooper's Creek. And so Burke and Wills and John King, and there might have been some others, uh, headed from Cooper's Creek up to the Gulf of Carpentaria. They didn't reach the Gulf of Carpentaria. They were stopped by swamp land. Anyway, they failed. They turned around, came back, were met with storms and rain, and they were delayed and delayed. And by the time they got to Cooper's Creek, the rest of the men had left. And so that's where they died, all but John King. I think a, a rescue party was sent Cooper's Creek and they found John King um, almost dead. Apparently they were cremated and their ashes are here. There was a movie made about Burke and Wills released in 1985. It's a pretty good film but it shows Burke and Wills reaching the Gulf of Carpentaria and there's this scene where they're on the beach there. That's always had me stumped as to why the filmmakers did that but Otherwise, worth watching. Just going around this gigantic monument to these men. Look at this, you can't even read what that says. Let's have a look. Uh, in a Crete. No, I can't read that. Death, I can see the word death. Companions in death and associates in renown. Okay. I wonder why that side is uh, worn more than the other sides. Leader and the second in command of the Victoria Exploring Expedition died at Cooper's Creek, June 1861. And there is a tree here. Okay, so there you go. And here is John King, who was the only survivor of the Burke and Wills exploration party. And still in pretty good nick. In the film Burke and Wills, the, the actor who plays John King is a scene at the end when he's giving a speech to everyone talking about what happened on the, on the journey. There's one of my favourite lines from a film where he says, You shit more than you eat. <laughs> I only lived to 31. Now apparently the Princess Theatre here in Melbourne is haunted by what people refer to as Melbourne's own Phantom of the Opera. What does this mean? In March 1888, an actor by the name of Frederick Federici was performing on stage in an opera for Faust. That the, according to reports, the show ended with Federici sinking dramatically through a trap door returning to the fires of hell. As he was lowered down through the stage into the basement, 
he had a heart attack and died. Since his death, there have been numerous reports of encounters with Federici's ghost, and a sighting has, in the past, been considered a blessing for an upcoming show. His ghost may be at the Princess Theatre, but his body is here. Frederick Baker Federici. Since then, the spirit of the deceased opera singer has been seen and felt in various places throughout the theatre, to the extent that the theatre would always reserve a seat in the dress circle for the ghost of the premiere of every show being performed there. The ghost of Federici is perhaps one of the most beloved traditions of the theatre, having been seen by popular performers such as Rachel Beck, Lisa McCune, Marina Pryor, and Bert Newton. Are you haunting the Princess Theatre, Frederick? Hmm? Hey, Frederick. You in there, mate? Are you in there? Or are you at the Princess Theatre? Which is it? Wow. Sorry, guys. Just kidding, mate. Don't haunt me. See you around, Frederick. This is the Prime Minister's Memorial Garden. Let's see who's in here. Hmm. Ah, John Malcolm Fraser, Prime Minister Fraser, 1930 to 2015. He was Prime Minister, well, he's the first one I remember in my lifetime. He was Prime Minister from 1975 to, to 1983. Now, Gough Whitlam was the Prime Minister in 1972 to 75, and Malcolm Fraser was the opposition leader, and he used the, the, they had control of the Senate, and they blocked supply, leading to a constitutional crisis, I believe it was called, and the Governor General, John Kerr, sacked Gough Whitlam. So, a Prime Minister got sacked. And I wish Gough Whitlam was here, but he's not. I think he's in Sydney. Well, may we say, God save the Queen. Because nothing will save the Governor General. He was here. Gough Whitlam stood here when he was uh, not resigned, when uh, he was sacked. Governor General sacked him. In 19, 1975, the year I was born. What are you doing? Oh, just talking to the camera. What do we have over here? Ah, Robert Menzies, longest serving Prime Minister of Australia. I am right on Cemetery Road here, as you can see, and it's pretty busy. You can probably hear cars. That's what that is. Anyway, Robert Menzies was Prime Minister twice, 1939 to 41, so I'm just going off my memory here, so I'm, if I'm wrong, I'll just put it on the screen. And then uh, 1949 to about 1966, so a long time. Uh, born in 1894, died 1978, and he's got his wife next to him. I did but see her passing by, and yet I love her till I die. So he was a very open-minded, progressive type of Prime Minister. For these years, of course, in the past, Sir Robert, you have been described as a racist. Have I? I have read this, yes. Well, I'm, if I were not described as a racist, I'd be the only public man who hasn't been. That, that's one of these jargons, isn't it? One of these mod words. You call a man a racist. <laughs> oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, he was uh, defending the white Australia policy in that interview. <laughs> we don't really talk about that much anymore. Anyway, what have we got here? Harold Holt. Now, Harold Holt would definitely not be there because Harold went for a swim in, I think, December 1967 and vanished, was never seen again. December the 17th, 1967, and Australia watched in shock and initial disbelief as news of the Prime Minister's disappearance in the surf off Portsea in Victoria spread across the nation. At 12 o'clock today, he went for a swim on the ocean side 
of the Portsea Beach. Actually, a few years ago, or more than a few years ago, I was filming a video in Queenscliff. And when I was finished, I went over to Portsea to have a look if there was something for Harold Holt there at the beach, or near the beach where you went missing, and there is. And I'll try and dig up that footage. This is Cheviot Beach. This is where Harold Holt went missing, 1967. Amazing looking beach, but you know, you wonder why he would want to uh, swim there. So it's a beautiful looking place. There's a bit of rain today, flies everywhere. Um, yeah, the view is, as you see, yeah, it's pretty amazing. He loved the sea, so 1908 to 1967. I am at Lilydale Lawn Cemetery in Lilydale, and in this cemetery is, I would say, the first ever famous, world famous Australian is buried here. That was Dame Nellie Melba, who was an opera singer, who was born in 1861 and died in 1931. And here at the Lilydale Lawn Cemetery, there's a guy on a bulldozer who's doing something there, so he's making a bit of noise, so I'll wait for him to go that way. And I've got helicopters in the sky. This is, this is what happens when you try and make a YouTube video and you have the time to come to a cemetery and there's a lot of noise. Anyway, uh, Nellie Melba got the name Melba because of her place of birth, which was Melbourne. So her real name was Helen Porter Mitchell. And born in Richmond and studied singing. She was married briefly, the marriage didn't work out. And then she went to Europe to study singing in Paris with a world famous singing teacher whose name I'm not going to try and pronounce, I'm just going to put it on the screen. I think that's wise. And yeah, became a famous opera singer. There is actually recordings of her on YouTube, of her singing, really old recordings of course. Some footage was discovered less than a year ago, some home footage of Dame Nellie Melba in her home in Coombe, which is in Coldstream. Footage of her, which is actually a place that you can visit and see. And there's the bulldozer. Melba died in Sydney in February 23rd, 1931, and the world mourned. After a memorial service in Scots Church, Melbourne, Melba was buried at Lilydale Lawn Cemetery. On her grave are Mimi's words from La Bohème, here's another word, <laughs> La Bohème, Adio Sensa Rancor, farewell without bitterness. And she visited Lilydale in 1902, and there's a picture here. And she's also on the $100 note. If you're lucky to have a $100 note, Dame Nellie Melba is on it. That's who that woman is on the $100 note. And the bulldozer's back. Yeah, he's just going backwards and forwards. 
backwards and forwards all day long. It's interesting that Nellie Melba's grave is here and just over here are houses. There's the fence line a few metres from her grave and the houses are right on the fence line which is not unusual nowadays. That's how they do it. Can you imagine living a stone throw from a cemetery? It's amazing. Right there, buried people. Someone's back door. Hmm. Beverly, why do you think that it will never ever happen to your husband? Do you know that he's simply that good? I know he's that good. I know he's so intuitive. I know he anticipates. He reacts so much quicker than any other person I've ever seen that he can just avoid those situations. Right now, I'm at Arthur's Creek Cemetery. I'm here to visit Peter Brock's grave. Now, I'm not going to pretend I know anything about sport. I know nothing about sport. But I've heard of Peter Brock. He was a famous racing car driver. Um, an absolute dream run for it who tragically died in 2006. He was one of the best in the world. Uh, and I'm just getting to know some of these people uh, while doing this video. I thought I'd, I'd include Peter Brock here in this video. You look at the car leap over there. It's set up reasonably soft. The front left wheel was about 18 inches off the deck, I think, through Reed Park. And listen to that car. Look at the rear wheel. It was off the deck over the top of the Philony. Oh, listen to the crowd, they're loving this. Peter Jeffrey Brock, known as Peter Perfect, the King of the Mountain, or simply Brocky, was an Australian motor racing driver. Born in Richmond in 1945. So what happened to Peter Brock? On the 8th of September 2006, while driving in the Targa West 06 rally, Brock was three kilometres from the finish of the second stage of the race at... Oh, Gidjiganup, <laughs> I'm going to put it on the screen, all right? About 40 kilometres from Perth, when he skidded off a downhill left-hand bend on Clinton Road for over 50 metres in his 2001 Daytona sports car. He hit a tree sideways in the driver's door. The 61-year-old Brock died within a couple of minutes of the impact, so that's, that is horrible. But that's what he loved doing. He died doing what he loved doing, but it doesn't sound like it was a, a particularly peaceful death. Someone has put little race cars here. When do you think you'll stop, stop racing? I think when I reach that stage of saying this is a chore and I've got to think about it. What if your wife asked you, Peter, I want you to stop racing cars, would you do that? The type of cemetery I love, nice and peaceful, middle of nowhere. Well, it's getting cold, it's about to rain, it's time to go home. Thank you for watching this video, hope you enjoyed it, and uh, if I ever think of some more deceased celebrities and where they're buried, I will maybe make another video, and there's things dropping from that tree there. So I'm just going to go talk to the cows. Okay, see you later. Hello, cows! You shit more than you eat.